first, first Henry gets me to shut up to preserve the reputation of the great governor, and then I find out instead of getting laid, he gets murdered, and nobody wants to know about it. I mean, nobody wants to know about conspiracy. I don't get it. Let me tell you something, all right? I know what I heard and what I saw, and I'm not going to stop until everyone in this country hears and sees the same thing, and you're going to help me. Yeah, you. You're going to find your pal Carp, and you're going to get that original film, because this isn't any good. I need the original, because if we don't get this out and on television for everybody to see, they're going to close the book. And any loose ends that happen to be hanging out like you or me are going to be cut right off. So you got your choice. You can be crazy or dead. Either will do. Hi, welcome to Around the World in 80s Movies. My name is Vince Leo. I'm the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I've been doing film reviews since 1996. I invite you to check out all of my written work there. Quipster.net is where to go, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. While you're there, I do encourage you to click the link that you will see there, not to this show, but to my other podcast that is a companion piece to Around the World in 80s Movies. It's called To the 90s and Beyond, where I look at, of course, films of the 1990s, as well as newer films that are inspired by movies that I cover there, as well as cover here on Around the World in 80s Movies. To the 90s and Beyond. Find the link at Quipster.net. Today I'm going to be getting into the second part of a series looking at the thrillers of Brian De Palma from the 1980s. Last episode I looked at Dress to Kill from 1980. I'm going to follow up with his next film from 1981. It's called Blow Out. Blow Out is an R-rated film. It does have strong violence, strong sexuality, nudity, and language. The runtime is an hour and 48 minutes. The stars are John Travolta, Nancy Allen, John Lithgow, and Dennis Franz. The director and the screenwriter for this, of course, is Brian De Palma. Now, after completing Dress to Kill, Brian De Palma, he explored several options as to what he wanted to follow that up with. One was his own script. He had been doing this modern remake of Treasure of the Sierra Madre, a favorite film of his, except for he was going to bring it up to date and it was going to have cocaine as the treasure rather than a gold mine. Another was more of a a long-time passion project of his called Act of Vengeance. This was based on a screenplay that he had been developing with this novelist named Scott Spencer, a gritty crime docudrama that was going to be centering around the real-life 1969 murders of reformist United Mine Workers leader Jock Yablonski and his family. He took it to Paramount. Paramount was very interested in doing Act of Vengeance, But eventually, they decided that there was going to be another project that they really wanted him to do first. They cajoled him. They gave him a lot of money, more money than he could say no to, to direct something they called Flashdance instead. He later abandoned that, of course. Obviously, you know, Adrian Lin would go on to direct that, and I'll get into the reasons why. De Palma did turn down Flashdance when I get into that movie at some point in the future of this show. But... He also had another idea, a political thriller idea called Personal Effects. Personal Effects was something that he had developed when he was making Carrie. His sound man had left for vacation, and he took his tape recorder with him. And De Palma thought that was kind of curious, and he wondered what kind of person would choose to be a sound man as that profession. Of course, a sound engineer we call today. Sound man is kind of a passe term. He'd heard anecdotes from his sound effects editors about standing for countless hours, trying to capture the perfect sound for one of the films that they were working on, including the ones for De Palma. And De Palma thought, well, what if there was a sound engineer out there capturing sounds? And during that time, they captured the sound of a murder during their search for movie sounds, while another person happened to be nearby capturing that same thing, a murder, but only in pictures kind of like the frames of the Sapruder film published in Life magazine. The murder could be solved by syncing the sound with the film, similar to that infamous Sapruder film, which De Palma thought would give him the inspiration to make a political assassination movie. He would mix elements of John F. Kennedy's assassination, which happened to be something that De Palma was absolutely obsessed with. He would read copious amounts of books about the Kennedy assassination, He also was fascinated by the Chappaquiddick incident involving Jack Kennedy's younger brother, Teddy. De Palma wanted to set personal effects in Montreal, Canada, to avoid comparisons between what he was going to do in the film and those aforementioned inspirations. Maybe it was too soon. Maybe it would just touch uh, maybe a raw nerve in America. He wanted to set it somewhat away. His protagonist in his 
initial idea for the film. A sound man named John, he would become an ear witness to an accident involving a car careening off a bridge and then into a river. John would save a woman that was inside, her name was going to be Kate, from the sinking vehicle. The male driver that's inside, though, drowns. He happens to be, he comes to find, a politician who is likely to replace the current prime minister in the approaching national election. The inadvertent assassin, he's called Dirty Tricks in the script, and he's out to kill John and Kate to try to tie up the loose ends of the accident-turned-assassination. Now, De Palma wanted to depart from his prior thrillers with personal effects. He was going to emphasize here fuller characterizations, because he'd been criticized for his characterizations in the past. Critics complained that he had gotten lost within his elaborate film design. He was more interested in camera placement and movements to try to propel scenes instead of relying on his actors. So De Palma decided he was going to run his 22-scene story plotline, but he really didn't know how to approach it, so he decided he needed some fresh eyes. In 1978, he coordinated with this film magazine called Take One to hold a screenwriting contest in the pages of one of their issues. Contestants selected two scenes from the plotline to try to flesh out the emotional underpinning and the motivation for the proposed characters. Five finalists would be selected to try to draft a full screenplay for which they would receive $500 each, and the winner would receive the prize of a contract to collaborate with De Palma on personal effects. De Palma received about a thousand submissions, but he struggled to find five worthy finalists, so only three were chosen, and the excerpts were published in Take One. Among the three that were considered passable, De Palma really liked 26-year-old W. Angel Meshi Jr.'s script, Bill Meshi. Meshi, as he went to work on a more complete script, decided to retitle the script from personal effects to what he considered to be a better title of IPS, which stood for inches per second, the speed measure for tape reel recordings, a key element of the film to be. The setting was moved in Meshi's script to New Jersey because... He happened to know very little about Canada. He didn't really know anything at all about its politics. So Meshi envisioned John as a disaffected burnout with a troubled past. Kate would be kind of a simpleton, using her sexuality as her only marketable asset. The problem was, in the future, nobody would know that Meshi would do this because Take One went bankrupt and ceased publication prior to the announcement of the winner. Nevertheless, Meshi received a letter from De Palma containing a $9,500 check as well as a contract. Meshi returned eagerly the signed contract, but he then heard absolutely nothing. Weeks, months, nothing. Despite repeated attempts, months later, though, he finally received a very curt letter informing him that his services were no longer needed. Although Meshi was not credited, there are still some minor elements, he says, from his treatment that were used in the final film, mostly for a scene where Kate, who would get renamed as Sally in the final film, Sally would try to get film footage from her employer, this blackmailer named Manny Carp. The second and third place contestants, Buzz Dixon and James A. Murray, they also claimed that elements were taken from their scripts, so they contacted Meshi and they tried to join forces to, to put a lawsuit to De Palma, but nothing would eventually come of it. There just wasn't enough of their scripts really left for them to get any real credit, and they were already paid for their work. De Palma felt that personal effects kind of agreed with Meshi. It wasn't really a dynamic title, but rather than IPS, he was going to change it to something more impactful, Blowout. He would rename the characters to avoid repeating ones he had done before. John and Kate happened to be ones that he used multiple times in prior films, including Dressed to Kill, of course. You know, Kate was one of the main characters in that one. De Palma knew that the title of Blow Out would invite inevitable comparisons to Michelangelo Antonioni's Blow Up due to a very similar storyline as well as its themes of how assassination explanations often explain really nothing. But he felt, you know, even if it did invite comparisons from the film critics, it was not going to be a commercial consideration because Blow Up was a 15-year-old film that was unfamiliar to most Americans. So he thought that Americans might compare it maybe more to Francis Ford Coppola's The Conversation due to its sound engineer embroiled in uncovering a political plot. 
Frequent collaborating producer George Alito, we talked about him in Dress to Kill. He joined him once again for Blowout. Alito encouraged De Palma to change the setting from Montreal to their hometown of Philadelphia because that's where American democracy began. The story would be much more relatable to American audiences if it was set in America, and the story is distinctly commenting on American themes of liberty and independence and truth that didn't make sense to be in Canada. So De Palma invented the Liberty Day celebration marking the centennial of the Liberty Bell's last ringing as an ironic tie-in, a celebration of American politics laced with tragedy. Responding further to his critics, De Palma avoided the overt Hitchcockian style that he had employed in prior thrillers and the overly graphic violence he had also come to be known for. He sought here with Blowout to broaden his popularity by maturing beyond exploring incessant action toward slowly building his characters and his story. Taking a little bit more time, his plot would retain his real-life attempt to find artistry behind the technical side of filmmaking. The finished film of Blowout concerns Jack Terry. Terry is a sound effects engineer working for cheapy horror exploitation flicks. A producer deems Terry's screams that he's using, as well as the wind effects that he uses in their latest slasher film called Coed Frenzy, they seemed very substandard. They were overused, so Jack determines he's going to find new recordings. While out and about, outdoors in a rural setting, Jack's tape captures audio from a nearby car careening off of a bridge and into a river after its tire blows out, hence the title Blowout. Jack immediately jumps to action and saves a drowning woman from the vehicle. The driver, though, dies, later revealed to be the presidential frontrunner in the upcoming election, Pennsylvania Governor George McRyan. Later on, when Jack is listening to the tape, he hears distinctly a gunshot just before that blowout, and that suggested to him that this was no accident. And later on, it's revealed that a photographer happened to also be in the area and captured film of the same incident, which Jack eventually synchronizes with his audio to prove that an assassin was the cause of the accident and the subsequent murder. The authorities, though, and the media want proof, but the conspirators are seeking to silence Jack's obsessive quest for the truth once and for all. Blowout offers a nihilistic look at the corrupt nature of American politics specifically. McRyan very much modeled after Ted Kennedy. He was a liberal who threatened the right-wing establishment enough to want to thwart him. The River Incident echoes the 1969 Chappaquiddick incident where Ted Kennedy's car would run off the road, killing his female companion, Mary Jo Kopechny, and then seeking his chances, perhaps, of becoming president ever one day. In this case, though, the politician inadvertently dies. The woman he's suspected of having an affair with, though, survives. The gunshot that emanates from a hidden assassin, that evokes the grassy knoll theory from JFK's assassination in Dallas. De Palma viewed Kennedy's assassination as a wake-up call to America, because this was the first time that the populace became aware that it was being lied to all along. However, like all of the books on the Kennedy assassination, the more De Palma would read, the less he felt he knew what the actual truth was. And so, too, that becomes a theme of blowout. Other recent events in the news from the 1970s, Watergate, the death of Nelson Rockefeller, as well as the Son of Sam and Zebra murders, they also influence parts of the plot of Blowout. In addition to the assassinations and killings and the tumult that was going on in America at the time, De Palma also decided to incorporate a story element that he had developed with David Rabe when they were working on the screenplay for Prince of the City. This was a a project that I briefly alluded to during Dress to Kill that he was attached to before eventually getting replaced by Sidney Lumet. A flashback sequence in Blowout shows Jack working with this undercover officer using wiretaps to combat corruption on the police force. De Palma uses this scene to foreshadow the tragedy to come because Jack would repeat the wiretapping with Sally for the finale. Jack's search for a new wind effect was an idea that came when De Palma was working with longtime sound effects artist Dan Sable on Dress to Kill, and he heard the same wind effects that Sable had used on prior movies and wanted him to freshen them up with something different. As far as the casting goes, Al Pacino, Richard Dreyfuss, Christopher Reeve, Harrison Ford, 
Richard Gere, John Hurd, and James Woods were consideration. Al Pacino was definitely the top choice, though, to play Jack Terry. De Palma wrote Jack basically as a version of himself, aging, very analytical, but also very cynical. Shortly before casting, though, actor and longtime friend John Travolta, they had gotten to know each other after Travolta had appeared in Carrie and very nearly Prince of the City, Travolta called De Palma. He was trying to encourage him to take on his own starring project that was going to be a movie that Travolta really wanted to do involving the stealing of Howard Hughes' Spruce Goose airplane. Travolta, a big fan of airplanes and kind of a, a burgeoning pilot on his own. When De Palma told Travolta that he couldn't do it, he was too immersed in Blowout, Travolta started inquiring as to what Blowout was about, and he requested that De Palma send him a script. Five days later, Travolta called De Palma, and he expressed that he really liked the script, and he wanted to do it. Playing a cerebral character would be a change of pace in his career, and finally break him out from doing young heartthrob-type roles. De Palma initially felt that Travolta was still too young, still too bright-eyed to play such a cynical and world-weary guy. But after meeting with Travolta to discuss it, De Palma began to see how much Travolta had matured since they last saw each other. Travolta, at that time, he was earning about $3 million a picture. He negotiated a $5 million salary to appear and blow up. The producers also felt that, hey, this was going to be a Travolta starring vehicle, this movie should be a lot bigger than this very small movie that was conceived of by De Palma. Producer Fred Caruso came on board and he added additional Mummer's Day Parade elements as well as fireworks in the climax. He wanted to make it bigger and bolder, spark a lot of color, much more excitement in what was initially a very subdued ending on the page. The budget of this small political thriller De Palma had in mind that was going to cost as little as $3 million eventually ballooned to a pretty sizable, for its time, $18 million, and that would become De Palma's highest budget to date by far. De Palma initially did not want to cast his actress wife, Nancy Allen, in the role of the woman that Jack rescues, Sally Bedina. He thought her career would eventually suffer if she was only appearing in his films, especially if she was playing basically another prostitute, although Allen claims that she's not a prostitute, she just happens to be used for her body, but not necessarily for her sex. De Palma, when he had written the script, he had envisioned somebody like Diane Cannon or Julie Christie could be in there. But Travolta immediately pressed for Nancy Allen to be his sidekick. He felt that they had great chemistry in Carrie. They were of similar age. He thought that that would make them develop feelings for each other that would make it a much more interesting film. Allen happened to be very eager to work with Travolta again, even if she had originally agreed that she shouldn't continue to do De Palma's films only. She accepted the role for the chance to work with Travolta. After struggling with a Philadelphia accent, Allen decided on a very different approach for how she was going to portray her character. Based on what she had read in the script, she had envisioned Sally as kind of a, a rag doll, a raggedy Ann doll in appearance. She would have red hair. She would be kind of an uneducated woman who spoke like a little girl who never quite matured into a woman. Allen reportedly based her performance specifically on the persona of Judy Holliday as she appeared in Born Yesterday, as well as Julieta Messina in La Strada. She felt that their characters fit the kind of mold she was looking for, and that audiences had great sympathy toward those characters. They should also have sympathy for Sally in Blowout, if she hit all of the same tones. A gullible girl caught up being manipulated in the world of greedy men. Travolta did have his challenges. He found the dialogue in Blowout very different from anything he had experienced before. He specifically begged De Palma to have some patience as he tried to work through it. He, in the past, had rarely memorized very lengthy, very intelligent speeches. So this was something very new to him. Anxiety started to set in with Travolta insomnia as well as they were making the film, which he eventually would say would contribute to the role. He played Jack as a very distracted and apathetic character. In the past, Defolta really didn't have to memorize more than one or two sentences at a time. So here, sometimes he would have full monologues. So he asked De Palma maybe if he could improvise a lot more as he was going forward to make it seem more natural instead of very robotic. De Palma agreed 
De Palma did storyboard the film. He allowed the actors, though, to have a lot of space to do that improvisation within the confines of his camera movements. As long as they hit the marks when they should and followed where the camera was going to go, the dialogue was a little bit more up for grabs. They could change it. They just could not change the shot composition he had in mind. Despite trying to avoid Hitchcock's style completely, there still are, or a lot of critics, they, they did comment that there were story parallels to several of Hitchcock's films that were still in Blowout. The main one involves a man obsessed with being right and then putting a woman in mortal jeopardy that was very much like Rear Window. Rear Window has, has a professional photographer in that one instead of a sound engineer. Both of them become obsessed with solving a murder mystery in the course of their narratives. The protagonist in Vertigo very similarly saves a drowning woman who turns out to be unwittingly involved in a crime scheme and then becomes a victim in the end. In Hitchcock's Notorious, the male lead, played by Cary Grant, asks his love interest, Ingrid Bergman, to endanger herself with the bad guy to prove his case in the end. De Palma caps Sally's death with a fireworks display that ironically contrasts the love scene in To Catch a Thief, Grace Kelly and Cary Grant film, where fireworks are used to consummate a romance. This was going to consummate the end of a life of a romance as well. De Palma does retain, though, beyond that, not very much Hitchcockian camera movements. He retains his own style. He does use split screen action as he had done in many of his prior films to economize the narrative element, he uses slow motion to try to heighten the tension. De Palma also famously uses this 360-degree rotating camera, which causes a very disorienting emotional effect for the scene where Jack discovers that his tape of audio evidence of the murder has been erased. The camera spinning like the tapes on the reel as Jack's anguish begins to take hold that he was right all along to everyone else. Editor Paul Hirsch was tasked with training Tavolta on how to handle the audio and the film editing equipment, such as scrubbing the sound as well as marking the film and the sound to sync both of them together. De Palma here takes on a lot to wrestle with. He explores how haphazard conspiracies often play out. The plot was merely to implicate Ryan in an affair, but Burke gets too zealous in his mission, Burke being the assassin played by John Lithgow, resulting in the governor's accidental death, and the conspiracy shifts to keeping their plot under wraps. De Palma also contrasts American freedom with this rotting society, as represented by the Liberty Bells used to tie together a serial killing cover-up. A couple of the murdered women that are in this trumped-up serial killing resemble Sally. They happen to be Nancy Allen's stunt doubles, among others. Sally's scream during her death is drowned out by the Bell's massive chime, along with the explosion of fireworks and the distraction of waving American flags, all of that very ironic keyed in with that feeling of people being sucked under by this corrupt society that we all live in. De Palma felt that in a capitalist society where everything is done for the sake of profit, that there is a corruption of the country's moral fiber, and lives become expendable to those with profit to gain. The system has grown too strong for any individual to change and too often engulfs innocent people into accepting that making money is much more important than having integrity. Living in this corrupt and materialistic capitalist society is cold. It's unforgiving. People either end up crazy or dead if they don't just succumb to it and work the system shamelessly themselves. Jack here represents another of De Palma's on-screen surrogates. Like Jack, De Palma felt tunnel vision, and he often lost focus on what was important. His obsession that he has would cause the loss of the person he would hold most dear. He would cut off himself from the world, except through efforts to try to replicate it through technology. In fact, De Palma was very cut off from the world during the filmmaking. He was very distant. Most people found, even Nancy Allen would find him very distant. He wore a Sony Walkman as he walked around because he wanted to keep people from engaging with him. He would grow very aloof and very caustic with it, with everyone, including Alan, which kind of became a damper on the relationship. As I mentioned, Sally would be a sacrifice in the end of this film. De Palma always intended Sally to be murdered by Burke in the finale. De Palma, Travolta, everybody else was committed to that ending, although Nancy Allen and editor Paul Hirsch did not think that it was a good idea for her to die 
they both felt that they had already built her up enough to be very sympathetic and the audiences were not going to enjoy it, and they certainly weren't. Paul Hirsch felt so strongly about the ending being the wrong choice that he vowed never again to accept any editing gig on a script that he personally didn't like in the future. The executives at Filmways also obviously would think it was a mistake commercially. They especially didn't like that it would eventually be used as a punchline because Jack uses Sally's death scream that he records as the sound effect, the perfect scream that he had been looking for in his movie. De Palma did not view this particular aspect as a gimmicky joke. In fact, he felt it emphasized more so Jack's inability to rationalize his guilt for causing the deaths of two people using his sound devices. Although Jack does save Sally's life at the beginning of the film, Jack's ultimately pointless quest for truth is what ends up killing her. If you're seeking a truth that people will not accept, you're either going to be deemed crazy or ignorant by everybody around you. And if somebody is worried about your evidence, you could end up getting murdered yourself. Jack concludes that America has become an amoral country without any of the respect for the life or liberty it often celebrates, and anybody who attempts to change that is going to be deemed expendable. His cynicism is what overwhelms him in the end to use the scream, a scream that he believes that if he keeps going, if he memorializes her scream in film, she will remain alive indefinitely somehow. Filmways and Nancy Allen also thought that it was a missed opportunity that De Palma did not accentuate any romance between Jack and Sally, especially given that you have two very attractive main stars with a lot of chemistry together. Audiences, they felt, also were not going to understand how a big star like John Travolta was not going to save the girl in the end. Even George Leto got involved and told them that it was probably going to be a mistake box office wise. And what's worse, when Burke is killing Sally, De Palma wanted actor John Lithgow, who he also cast as the villain in his 1976 thriller called Obsession, to be much rougher with Alan than he really wanted. Lithgow protested. He thought that any rougher and he was going to actually physically hurt her. But De Palma wanted more. Leto said that the perfect ending in his mind would have been if Jack saved Sally and then the epilogue would have them going together to go see the Broadway show Sugar Babies, which she earlier in the film wants to see. Notably, though, the blowout novelization does include the Jack-Sally romance and he does save her life in the end. So if you want to see kind of a more upbeat version of this film, read the novelization and you will probably understand what could have been if De Palma was much more commercially minded about what he was going to do in the film. Blowout is photographed by Vilmos Zygmunt, who De Palma had worked with for Obsession. He was the top choice for Dress to Kill, but he was unavailable. Zygmunt specifically decided to have a color palette very reminiscent of the American flag, reds, whites, and blues. He did not shoot all parts of this film, though. The production had to halt for a a time after multiple boxes of unedited negative print footage was stolen along with other non-related items from the delivery truck that was making another stop in Manhattan before it would be all flown out to Los Angeles. The boxes, unfortunately, that were taken represented the most expensive work that was done on the film, mostly of Travolta driving through the Liberty Day Parade with all of the hundreds of extras that that entailed, as well as all of that location shooting in the heart of Philadelphia. De Palma absolutely raged, when he had heard that his footage was stolen. He scoured trash cans all over the Manhattan area where they presumably were lost. He had hoped that the thief would not realize the value of all of this film and would have discarded it. Unfortunately, they did not find it. Even after a reward for the whereabouts of the film, it resulted in a lot of fake leads. They decided to opt to use their insurance to reshoot the missing sequence all over again. Zygmunt had already left, unfortunately, for another project by the time of this, so they hired a different Hungarian cinematographer, Laszlo Kovacs, who came in with absolutely no notice to shoot elements of the parade sequence all over again. Travolta's performance here is very subdued. It's very disciplined, very unlike anything he had done in the past. De Palma was very happy because Travolta happened to bring a lot of heart, a lot of soul, a lot of warmth for Jack Terry that did not exist on the page. Travolta is a very charismatic actor and even subdued, it all comes through. Travolta fans, though, did not feel that at the time because they were not ready 
for Travolta to be taking such a departure in his characterizations. They did not consider it money well spent to see the Travolta that they knew and loved playing such an unlikable character. De Palma was particularly unhappy that Paramount chose to release the film during the summer. This was not a blockbuster a family film. It was not a feel-good story. It just did not belong in the summer. He felt that it should have been released in the fall instead, but the studio had high hopes for the potential commerciality of Blowout, even with its sad ending, even with some of the dour moments, because Travolta's star power was so immense at that time that they thought it was going to still become a runaway hit. However, this was a very inward-facing Travolta he didn't dance. He didn't sing. He, did, he does not really flash his winning smile very much. And that did turn off a lot of people that normally would have gone to the theater to see such things. Critics also seemed very jaded toward De Palma. They derided Blowout for its violence, its, his nepotism, his blatant lifting of themes from other films. Unlike Dress to Kill, though, this time audiences also were not keen. The ending was just too downbeat. The epilogue where Jack recycles Sally's real-life scream into his B-movie that he was working on was considered a completely flagrantly tasteless joke by so many people. Travolta fans in particular did not care for his character. He was going against the grain of all of his more popular performances in recent years. Things that they wanted to see and they weren't getting, and they were getting more of this plot-heavy political thriller than they really wanted to experience. And as such, Blowout only took in $8 million at the U.S. box office, less than half of its overall budget. In retrospect, Blowout was considered just too pessimistic a film, and it came out in a period that was already primed for optimism. The mood of the country had already changed at the time of Blowout's release. The United States did not want to continue recycling all of the cynical, introspective realizations of the 1960s and the 1970s. The U.S. government engaged in a lot of conspiracies for power. They preferred the more simple message, mourning in America, that optimism of the Reagan promise that looked forward instead of backward to achieving American dominance in the world, to be an exemplar of democracy in a world of despots and madmen. The United States should be seen as the example for the rest of the world to follow instead of continue to dissect itself with all of its doubts and feelings of inadequacy. A return to the films of the traditional cinema of the 1950s is what was called for. The 80s really emulated the 50s, just like we emulate a lot of things in the 80s and the 90s today. Blowout refused to comply with that candy-coated outlook. It offered no love story despite having the right actors for it, the bad guys ultimately prevail. There's no happy ending for anybody involved that we come to care about, and especially for the most sympathetic character. De Palma's view here is that terrible things can and will happen in this world. Most of it will end up going unresolved, and we all feel capitalism's corrosive effects. De Palma would grow frustrated that blowout fizzled financially, but notes, well, other fine films didn't connect with audiences at that time, but what he was most depressed about was that after fizzling with Blowout, nobody was returning his calls afterward at all, despite all of his prior success. And the stress eventually would tax De Palma's marriage with Nancy Allen. Allen was also miffed that she would receive a lot of negative press, not only for the role here, but also just being his wife. The relationship grew distant, very unpleasant, and Alan grew resentful that she had not successfully made a name for herself independently of her husband. Blowout, though, has been reevaluated over the years and currently ranks as, in the minds of many, De Palma's most accomplished thrillers. Even though it may have been kind of a miss at the time, you know, these things kind of cycle back and forth, and a lot of people today consider Blowout among De Palma's finest works. De Palma was often criticized for promoting a lot of sex and violence in his movies, but he here is inspired by a lot of real-life events in recent American history. In fact, he uses that sex and violence to assert that movies really are a reflection of a perverse and violent society. It's not him causing sex and violence, it's the society that is causing him to reflect it like a mirror on the screen literally represented when Jack places Sally's scream into his movie's audio track, and that reminds him of the folly of exposing the truth about the rot that grows within 
a capitalist American society. Jack eventually accepts that the fight against our corrupt society is always going to be doomed to failure. His actions result in two people's deaths and probably would have resulted in his ruination if he decided to not just embrace it or at least become apathetic to it. De Palma postulates, both in the narrative and in his own work, that images and sounds are much more important than words. But without the right words, Jack can't convince others of the truth that he knows, and the film ends with his retreat back into the sounds and the images that are the only things in this world that he can trust. Blowout is actually a really great film for its era. I consider it one of De Palma's best films. It's one I enjoy watching over and over, but I also find there are aspects of the tragedy involved that make it kind of a heavy film for a lot of people. A lot of people are not going to be on board. Now, you must know that Vertigo, it happens to be my favorite film, so you can get caught in the cycle of always wanting the woman to survive at the end, but never having it happen. And you just continue keeping her alive by rewatching the film. Somehow she never dies in that way. And that's kind of a theme of Blowout. Sally's scream will keep her alive forever. Quentin Tarantino, in fact, agrees. He says that Travolta's performance in Blowout was the reason that he cast him in Pulp Fiction. It's one of his all-time favorite films, probably in his top three favorite films of all time. And De Palma also loved Blowout so much. He used Pino Donaggio's score, at least part of it, Jack and Sally's theme, in Death Proof. Uh, Blowout, if you're a De Palma fan, it's a must-see. It is kind of a bitter, cynical pill to swallow, but if you're ready for that, if you're accepting of that, I do think that De Palma really shows a lot of growth from his prior thrillers. And for all of this, it's a close call for me. I almost want to give it four stars. I don't. I can't quite say that it's a film for everybody. It definitely is not. But I do think that Blood is a solidly good film. I do recommend it to most people who like thrillers, especially of the 1980s. Three and a half stars on my scale means I do think that this is a good film and worth going out of your way to see if anything that I said sounds of appeal to you. I think Travolta is terrific in this film as well. And I can see why Tarantino decided, hey, this was a great talent that nobody was using and he would use him in Pulp Fiction and kind of make him a star once again, at least through the 90s. So three and a half stars out of four is what I give Blowout. As far as what I'm going to be doing next week, well, we're going to kick forward a couple of years. We're going to skip over Scarface because that, you know, there are thriller elements to it, but it definitely is not quite on the same level as the trio of films I'm going to be talking about. In fact, De Palma regresses quite a bit. He was so upset that Blowout did not become a commercial success that he was going to go full bore into doing the kinds of films that caused him to have success before. The Hitchcockian elements, the sex, the gore was all cranked to 11 on the next film I'm going to be talking about, which is called Body Double from 1984. Keep the kids out of the room if you have this on. It is a big, bold, violent, and vulgar film in so many ways and something I have a lot to say about, and I hope that you'll join me on the next episode. Body Double from 1984. If you have your own thoughts on Blowout that you want to impart, you can write to me. You can find my contact information at my website. That's at quipster.net. Links to my Twitter feed, my Facebook page, and my Instagram. But I do encourage you, if you do want to write to me at length, that you do it by finding my email address. You can find it at quipster.net. I always like hearing from people. So if you have not written me, or if you haven't written me in a while and you want to let me know what you think of the show, at least the more recent episodes, I do encourage you to reach out to me. And I'll look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, thank you so much for joining me as I travel around the world in 80s movies. Mm